Hello everybody and welcome back to our discussion on realism. So today's purpose is going to be to look at the life of our author for our study on realism, Leo Tolstoy. So just to get everybody in the setting of who Leo Tolstoy is and what century he comes from and what location he comes from, this is the basic information that we need to know about Leo Tolstoy before we dive into the more intricate details of his life, which are very, very interesting and are heavily seen in the way that he chooses to write. So Leo Tolstoy is a Russian author. He was born in 1828 and died in 1910. He's known for being not only a great novelist, but also a great moralist. So if any of you are familiar with either of his two biggest novels, War and Peace and Anna Karenina, which some of you should have read in Arabic last year, I believe, we see in the way that Tolstoy paints his characters that he cares deeply for painting people realistically, but also discussing certain moral issues that were heightened during his time period. But that being said, he is also a man of many contradictions, and we see that in the way that his life tries to bring together these two contradictory spheres, right? This sphere of growing up as a wealthy aristocrat, but also this sphere as someone who was a moralist and lived by very, very high moral standards and attempts to grapple with this throughout his life. And we're going to see a lot of his life and his morals in particular portrayed in our key text for this unit, How Much Land Does a Man Need, written by Leo Tolstoy. Beginning then with Tolstoy's childhood, we see that despite a number of personal tragedies, Tolstoy himself is remembered as having described his childhood as a happy one. So before the age of 10, Tolstoy ends up losing both of his parents and he's then raised by his grandmother and aunt, who also subsequently pass away. So by any account, this would be a very depressing childhood, uh, in my opinion at least, right? But he recalls his childhood as very, very pleasant. And a huge part of that is the fact that he's raised by an aunt and a cousin who he loves deeply and who he remembers very, very fondly. Additionally, he also inherits his family's estate. So despite the fact that he would have been the younger of his brothers in Russia in particular back in this time period, it would have been something very normal for the youngest male child to inherit the family estate. And this family estate is called Yasnaya Poliana. And he inherits this land, which I've pictured for you on the right, when he's just 19 years old. And guys, this place is not only huge, but beautiful. And along with inheriting this home and this land, Tolstoy also inherits a great deal of family wealth. And although he ends up becoming a bit of a gambler and a drinker and living the nightlife, Tolstoy right, uh, has a very, very good growing up period, right? particularly in his youth. And towards the end of his youth, so the turning into his 20s, he joins the army along with his brother. And in the beginning, this is a good experience for Tolstoy because where he is stationed first doesn't see any war in, in particular, right? Or at least war in the sense where we think of death and devastation and destruction. But this all ends in 1854 when Tolstoy is enlisted to fight in the Crimean War. And so any of you history buffs would know that this war in particular was very fierce but also badly managed. So a number of soldiers would have died in this war and Tolstoy in particular has a very close call with death. And his experience in war is going to later influence one of the two novels we've already named, War and Peace. Moving on then to his earlier years as a writer. So Tolstoy begins writing much like a number of writers will, right, which is journaling. So the simplest form of writing and sometimes the most authentic, right, just pouring out your thoughts and your emotions. And from the age of 18, Tolstoy begins to keep journals and really interesting, right, you guys, he does this for a majority of his life. So we know so much about Tolstoy because of the journals that he kept. And additionally, we also see that he publishes his first work called Childhood. And this is essentially a fictionalized account of his own happy childhood years. 
And over the, the years that pass after this first publication in 1852, we see that Tolstoy's writing takes on those key characteristics of realism. So when he writes about characters and situations, he does so authentically. So he's not trying to romanticize life or paint life as better than it actually is. He's very real in the way that he discusses his characters and, and life. In addition, even though we see that he goes through a vast number of other changes in life, which we're going to talk about in a moment, he never abandons this principle of realism, of painting life the way that it is. And we can see the way that he viewed the importance of realism in this quote below. He says, an artist is an artist because he sees things not as he wishes to see them, but as they really are. And really, we could paint this as the motto for realism, right? Remember, this is what they're all about, about painting a realistic picture of life, not a picture of life as we hope that it would be. So again, Tolstoy is very, very famous today, in large part because he gains this great literary significance during his lifetime. So by the age of 32, he is a literary hero in Russia. People read his works and they love his works. In the midst of this, he marries Sophia Bears, who is a spirited young woman and also a family friend of theirs, and their marriage is described as incredibly happy, at least for the first 15 years of their marriage. And this is in large part due to the fact that Sophia is very, very encouraging of Tolstoy's works and helps him in his, in his writing. So she essentially encourages his literary genius. And it's during this time that he completes War and Peace. And he also writes Anna Karenina, the novel that I referred to earlier that most of you should be familiar with because of your classes last year. And these two pieces of works, although incredibly long, yes, are great examples, not just of Tolstoy's analytical power, but also beginning hints of his moralistic ideas, right? Living a life that is not just about wealth and being part of the aristocracy, but giving to those who are less fortunate. And an interesting fact for those of you who are familiar with the novel Anna Karenina, the character of Constantine Levin, this character who is all about p bringing up the, the lower class, right, rejecting those uh, ideas of the upper class where you give in to wealth and abundance, but actually trying to seek to better the lives of people in lower stations, this character is based on Leo Tolstoy himself. So even through his writing, we get to see the early influences of his moral and ethical high ground. But then we come to Tolstoy's crisis, and this is one that is called existential. So when we say an existential crisis, we mean this crisis of why am I here? What is the purpose of life? And this all comes on the heels of the great success that he receives with Anna Karenina. And he essentially has it all. He has a beautiful wife with a large family. He has this beautiful home. He has wealth and abundance. But he comes to ask himself this question. What is the point of having all of these goods? If I'm going to die anyway, I can't take these things with me. So really, there must be something higher to obtain and to achieve than what I'm currently achieving. And this sets him on the path of looking towards religion to try to understand what he needs in life, what greater purpose there is. And he turns to the Russian Orthodox Church in an attempt to understand this hole that he feels inside of him. But just as we discussed in the Middle Ages with Dante, Tolstoy is going to find out an unfortunate truth that oftentimes when we come to church, not as an individual church, but church as a large entity, as an institution, unfortunately, 
and they are oftentimes open to corruption. And he sees this very clearly, not just in the Orthodox Church, but also in the government in general. And it is because of this severe disappointment that he has in the church as an institution that he eventually begins to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. And the pinnacle of this is when he writes a confession, which is a piece in which Tolstoy analyzes this existential crisis that he goes through. And he reveals that he ultimately finds this new purpose. And his new purpose in life is to find and promote goodness in the world, right? to essentially leave the world a better place than he found it. And he begins to put this in place immediately, right? And we already see this even before this existential crisis hits. Because remember, Tolstoy, even from the beginning, is described as this great moralist. So not only is he responsible for opening up schools for the children of the serfs who served on his plantation, for lack of a better word, right, his estate, he also organizes famine relief during the Great Famine in Russia. So we see that all of this sort of spiritual turmoil within Tolstoy reaches its apex when he finds its relationship with Jesus and when he realizes that I need to do something good with my life. So taking this new purpose that Tolstoy finds, he begins to push away those things in life that he views as over the top, as part of this upper class society and things that really put this great divide between the upper class and the lower class. And part of this also is reflected in the way that he then chooses to live his life. So he becomes a pacifist, someone who does not advocate for violence, he becomes a vegetarian choosing not to eat meat. And additionally, he becomes a supporter of nonviolent civil disobedience. So think about Martin Luther King Jr. and the acts that we discussed last year. This would have been the type of disobedience that Tolstoy would have been about. And disobedience for the purpose of lifting up those in the lower class who he felt were being gravely mistreated by the system. But this doesn't just apply to the way he lives his life, but also now the way that he chooses to write. So during this new period, he writes a novel called Resurrection. And this novel challenges not just the church, but also government and corruption. And so obviously the Orthodox Church nor the Russian government is going to look at this very kindly. And as a result, he is excommunicated by the Russian Orthodox Church. And additionally, his works are banned in Russia. So because of this spiritual enlightening that he has, he goes from this literary master who is praised in Russia, who is then viewed as someone who has lost his good standing. This also, just a tidbit, for those who are fans of another excellent Russian author, Anton Chekhov, they become great friends during this time period. And Anton Chekhov is also going to, to be noted as having grieved deeply over the death of Tolstoy. This is how close their relationship was. And again, obviously, because Tolstoy's writing from the very beginning went hand in hand with his morals, with his ethics, because we see this change in his morals and his ethics, we're also logically going to see a change in the style in which he wrote. But I want to make this very clear. It is not that we see him choose to move away from realism. The opposite, in fact, he goes much deeper into realism, sticking with this authentic portrayal. But now he dismisses his earlier novels, so War and Peace and Anna Karenina, as these frivolous pieces of writing that really, in a sense, painted the upper class in this good light. And instead, he is then going to turn to his later works and say that I want to write things that are simple and direct things that are accessible to the common people, so easily understood, and that have a clear moral. And this is going to be really good for us too, right? As we dive into his short story, How Much Land Does a Man Need? So this writing then is going to be much more accessible than other writings we've 
looked at in the past because he seeks to, to make it so. And also, it's going to shape the way that we choose to analyze the text. So as we read, we need to constantly have our eyes peeled or aware of that theme, that moral conviction that Tolstoy is trying to give through his text. So unfortunately, even though Tolstoy begins life on an incredibly happy note, he has a rather unhappy ending. And despite the fact that he attracts a number of followers after his conversion to Christianity, he ends up alienating most of his family, which is incredibly sad. And looking at it from, from an outsider's perspective is driven perhaps by this misunderstanding or this, this zealousness that he has in his new spiritual take on life. But a lot of this drive in pushing away his family is the fact that he becomes increasingly disturbed by this gap that he sees in his moral convictions, but the fact that he still continues to live this aristocratic life. Right? Because remember, Sophia doesn't have this existential crisis with him. She's still very much married to him and in love with him, but she has children and a family to think about. So their estate and their aristocratic life would have been important in upholding their family. So she doesn't want to turn away from the lifestyle that they have. And so Tolstoy then has this war within himself, this internal conflict. And he right, wants to live a better life, one that better fits with his morals, but he sees no other way to do that than to leave his family. So he ends up fleeing his home on October 28th, 1910. And so remember, we're talking about Russia here, so the weather is not going to be good the closer you get to winter. It's going to be incredibly cold. And in his escape, Tolstoy actually ends up contracting pneumonia, and he's found at a train station not too, too far from his home a few days later, and he is brought back, and on his deathbed, these are the final words that he says, to seek, always to seek. And there's a lot of stock placed in anyone's last words, right? Think about it for yourself. What would you want your final words to be? And so it's very important that we look at Tolstoy's final words and really trying to analyze what do you think he meant in to seek, always to seek. And thinking about what is he employing us to seek? Perhaps to always seek that moral good and that moral and ethical high ground that we have, no matter our station or our place in life. That's gonna be it for this video, video number 24. In our next video, we're going to begin to read how much land does a man need? So there are times where I'm going to ask you to read the portions of the text uh, in full before you come to watch the video. So if you do have your literature textbooks at home, please keep them handy. If not, I am going to find a PDF copy of the story and I'll upload that for you on Google Classroom. But please, this is extra important in terms of making sure you are keeping up to date with the videos in case I do ask you to read ahead. For the next video, you don't have to do anything except have the text in front of you because we're going to begin to read it together. And as we read, we're going to focus on two main things. So one, looking at theme and fiction. So taking those key characteristics of identifying theme that we learned about last year and applying them, uh, applying them specifically to realist text, but also learning how to draw conclusions. So that's going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.